Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 76 on the podcast, uh, today on the 6th of June, 2018. Yeah, um, I didn't mean to be uh, to be off for so long, actually, but I've been a little sick over the last few days, so I haven't been able to get on to do an episode or talk at all. So with that in mind, happy belated Canada Day to everybody. Uh, I hope you had a great one. I hope you enjoyed the fireworks wherever you were, or at least enjoyed your own uh, your own fireworks. And for any Americans watching, happy belated Independence Day as well. Happy Fourth of July. I hope I hope everyone uh, down the states had a good party. Uh, not going to stay on too long, but it kind of pissed me off seeing that uh, Mayor Jim Watson wasn't going to go to the uh, going to go to the celebration for July Fourth because, despite everything that's going on with our with America right now, with our relationship, despite all the the trade problems and that, we're still allies. We're still friends. You know, our relationship hasn't gotten that bad. So the fact that there were actually some Canadian MPs and politicians that were willing to boycott the entire celebrations at the uh, U.S. ambassador's place. Just over everything that's happened with Trump, I think, is ridiculous because you're also alienating uh, the entire country just for the sake of one man, which is a stupid thing to do, in my opinion, but that's not really that important. So the first thing I wanted to bring up today is actually, I'm not going to focus, uh, it has to do with Canada Day. I'm really not going to focus on it long. But it sort of shows the state I find that Justin Trudeau finds himself in uh, when he he likes to act like he is a leader of Canada. He loves Canada, blah, 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 blah. And he's even been there. We have that old audio clip of him getting mad at, uh, back when he was just a politician, just a sitting member of parliament, where he says, like, it's ridiculous to asking if just, n- Justin Trudeau loves his country. Of course, I love my country, but this is definitely not going to be helping him in uh in that sentiment that he loves his country so this was actually taken from canada day this video was actually from canada day so let's get into her hi i'm justin trudeau here with my friend the minister of immigration and member of parliament for york southwest and ahmed hussein we all want to wish somali canadians a happy somalia independence day and a happy canada day somalia Anolato. Did you catch that? Did you notice how Can- Happy Canada Day, when he's talking to Somali Cana- Canadians, came second? It was Happy Somalian Independence Day that came first? Why would you do that? You're the leader of our country, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they shouldn't celebrate uh, Somalian Independence Day. I, I, like They do this all the time, and it's not just Justin Trudeau, it's leaders all across premiers and mayors. They always do this when a certain community celebrates an event. They'll put an announcement, happy whatever the day is. So I'm not saying that they shouldn't recognize the whole Somalian Independence Day, but when you put Canada Day second in comparison to that, like it's really just showing more of a preference for this uh, Independence Day for another country uh, over your own, you know? And I actually did not know that uh, Somalian Independence Day took place uh, around that time, you know, the 30th or the 1st. But still, it's like, you're our leader. You should be putting on our country, recognizing our country first before you start recognizing another country. Besides, Somalian independence really meant that the whole country went down into a shithole. I, I need to stop using that word. I don't know why I've picked it up so much, but the last few times I've been talking about certain things, I've been using the word shithole. Uh, but the... Um, but Somalia these days, it's not exactly a country you want to go visit. It's a lawless country that is just filled with literally pirates. It's literally filled with pirates. So I uh, I don't necessarily think that Somalia independence was exactly the best thing to happen for that country. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm still getting over my cold. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just thought that was uh, a little ridiculous. It's like, so, welcome, happy Somalian independence. Oh, yeah, it's a gun battle over there constantly. <laughs> All right, if you say so. 
So probably the most recent uh, news so far ha uh, I wanted to get into had to do with Doug Ford finally met with um, Justin Trudeau. It was their first meeting since uh, Ford became the premier back in um, 29th of June, actually. Which, speaking of which, did I, when I started this up, did I say it was June? It's supposed to be July, the 6th of July. I just realized that. But anyway, this is the first time that uh, Premier Doug Ford has met with the um, has met with the Prime Minister of Canada, which I guess not bad but first week, really. So, but uh, of course, it was sort of they had their smiles, they had their pleasantries, as when we put in quotation marks, political pleasantries. But uh, but then we it, all the everything took issue after Doug Ford left because this is another example of Justin Trudeau being a two-faced son of a bitch because once again just like he did at the g7 with trump is he puts on a very nice smile and he uh he puts on a very nice smile and he pu pulls out all the pleasantries when ford's here and then when ford leaves he gives a press conference and shits on ford so it's very pretty much the same thing and this is why people who have used the term described justin trudeau beta male do so because this is a very underhanded beta male thing to do. I mean, the, the sort of that's those sort of terms are, I think are um, are like not as many people are using them again. I think it was more of a trend using the term alpha male, beta male for a while, but still, it's a very beta male thing to do. Let's just take a quick look at this press conference that we're talking about. The Premier has uh, withdrawn Ontario's support for the uh, asylum uh, program that, that they were doing with the cities and with your government, and they, they've accused you of creating a migrant mess uh, on that crisis. I just want to know what you think about that and what you're going to do to now that Ontario is not cooperating with the federal government on this program. Well, this was uh, the first opportunity I had to sit down with Premier Ford to talk about uh, the uh, asylum seeker issue and uh, irregular uh, migration. This is. Okay, first of all, what the hell is that? Irregular migration is not a real term. It is not a real word. It is a word made up by Justin Trudeau and his government in order to mitigate the damage that was caused, caused by the illegal migrant crossings. By these people, literally illegal migrants crossing our borders, but just they say irregular migrants. Nobody has ever used this term before. I, Quite possibly they have. I'm being a little... Uh, hyperbolic when I say that but the point is it's not an actual term it's something that he made up in order to try and make himself look better by calling him irregular instead of illegal that way he can also sort of pledge his support for them uh, but then at the same time he can sort of you know be like oh you know but like I need to do something about these irregular migrants they're not illegal they're just irregular so that's a bullshit term made up by Justin Trudeau obviously something fairly important. Uh, it didn't seem to me that the Premier was quite as aware of our international obligations uh, to uh, the, uh, the uh, UN Convention on Refugees. Uh, there is the real problem too, right there, is he says that Ford, well first of all, I'm, I'm pretty sure Ford is well aware of what, of this that he's talking about. I mean, like, he's talking about our international obligations. There should not be international obligations for Canada. There should not be the UN. It should not be that the UN is coming in telling Canada how it should take in its immigrants. And besides, who is the UN to come in and tell and tell us about our illegal migrants? We have perfectly legal immigration. That is being circumvented by the people who are just crossing our borders with no care for our laws or regulations. Now, if America was a war zone, we could have that conversation. It would be a different situation if America was in the middle of a civil war and these people feared for their lives. They're like, fuck this, I'm going to Canada. <coughs> Excuse me. So that would be a completely different situation, but it's not even close to that. The, point, the thing is, is, America is still a very prosperous country, and recently it's been doing much better. In fact, you could say that Canada is doing worse than America right now in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, uh, monetary value. I mean, the American dollar keeps going up and the Canadian dollar keeps shrinking. So all in all, 
it's kind of hard to claim that you're seeking refuge from America, which literally is the most prosperous country in the world. And my question to you is, if America was such a racist country to begin with, then why did these people even go there in the first place? We also know for a fact that there are people that are coming into the country that are going, getting their visas from America, and then immediately making the trip towards Canada. They use the entrance to America as an excuse to go and cross our border illegally. These are not uh, asylum seekers. These are not refugees. And the idea that the UN is going to come in and tell us how to dictate how we take in our refugees, our illegal migrants, is absolutely ridiculous. In fact, this is exactly the point in time when Justin Trudeau and his government's representative to the UN should go there and tell the UN to go fuck themselves. This is why I hate the UN. I hate the fucking useless nation so goddamn much. Hold on. Uh, as he might have been, so I, I spent a little time explaining. Hold on, we're actually going to go back there just a little bit. Allegations uh, to uh, the uh, the uh, UN Convention on Refugees, uh, as he might have been. So I, I spent a little time explaining uh, how the asylum-seeking system works and how our our uh, our, uh, our our system uh, is supposed to operate. Uh, but at the same time. I, uh, I uh, agreed that it would be good for our officials to sit down and get clarity on how we can actually work together uh, to ensure that we are uh, holding true to our values, but making sure that our immigration and, and refugee system is being applied in its integrity. I, uh... How is it being applied in its integrity when there are people that come in, pay their way in order to uh, pay their way in order to be in Canada, and actually go through the legal process of getting permanent residency? And then um, permanent residency and then uh, uh, citizenship when there are people who are just crossing the border and then demanding uh, for the government to look after them and for, for housing from the people. I mean, I've been having some trouble now finding the article, which makes me believe it's been taken down or hidden in some way because it was really not a good article. But it was talking about how Mayor John Tory and the uh, Toronto City Council was starting to ask the people of Toronto the homeowners of Toronto to take in some of these uh, these uh, refugees because they were they were running out of space for to place them they were running out of place in the homeless shelters they were putting people in college dorms which you know colleges and universities are going to be starting up again in the next couple months which means that these people are getting kicked out because there's going to be students coming back who are paying for those dorm rooms. And I actually wonder what sort of condition they're going to be in when they commit. Because those dorm rooms are not very good for housing uh, large groups of people. Like The thing is, too, though, I guess, I guess it might be fine. But the thing is, too, is while the press always shows us pictures of families coming across these borders, there are so many individual pe guys that come across, like literally individual men that are coming across the border to Canada but those are never shown by the press. They're always showing the families. It's like, oh, these are the people who are trying to get across the borders. Yeah, some of them, not all of them. And uh, the thing is, too, is like Justin Trudeau has completely circumvented our immigration system by the way he's handled the whole situation. He hasn't put a stop to this. It is completely, it is escalating, if anything. So... This whole situation is just absolutely ridiculous, and it was Doug Ford called them out in their meeting together about how Justin Trudeau did next to nothing in order to prevent this and how the crisis they're currently facing has is pretty much his fault. But Justin Trudeau instead waits till uh, Doug Ford is gone and then sort of back and talks back to him like he is now, like he did at the G7. <coughs> And the thing is, too, is we can just look at the t uh, at some of the people who are crossing the border and to see that it really is not the immigration cr – um, these are not refugees in the way that we normally think of them. And this was actually shown a while ago by uh, – this was back in August 7, 2007 by the Rebel when they were showing some of the people that were coming across the border, you know? Let's take a look at it. It was Faith Goldie, actually. Now, a constant trend that we noticed was just how – well-dressed many of these so-called refugees were men who look more like rap stars than refugees decked out with fancy headphones and chain necklaces leather jackets 
brand new track suits and really clean shoes. One after another, we witnessed adult men exit taxis with flat brimmed hats, fine luggage and brand new cell phones just before walking across the border and declaring themselves refugees. As for procedure, well, little has changed. While yeah, so what kind of refugee is that? Is somebody who is actually having uh, the having nice clothes? And actually, I think the most saying part of it, not even the cell phones, but they said clean shoes, because I think that's very important. The idea usually is is of a refugee that has walked miles upon miles in order to cross into another one's country to get away from the dangers that is posed to them in their own country. Which number one. They're not even coming from their own country. They went, came from their country to America, and then they're going to go from America to Canada, which I've already talked before about how we have a whole human trafficking ring that's going on right now uh, in, order to get, uh, in order to get these people into the border. It's literally an industry right now in America. So that's going on. But then, yeah, for me, it was just the idea of clean shoes. It's like, well, you really couldn't have gone far really having to travel that hard in order to uh, get to where you needed to go. And actually, something else was, uh, I think it was this guy right here. Yeah, hold on. Let me pull it up. Is what he ends up saying. Oh, uh, I don't have, I don't have uh, paperwork. I don't have nothing. So uh, you got a de is deportation. So I'm... Um, that's it. Yeah, so this guy ends up saying he doesn't have the paperwork. You should have a paperwork if you're staying in another one's country. You should have a visa or something like that, which is... It's very telling to me. It's very telling for the type of people that are coming across this border and the type of these refugees when all you're seeing is them talking... When they're coming in nice clothes and then they're also talking about this... About how they don't have paperwork. Now, I'm sure that's not true for everybody... But all in all, but all in all, you know, it's kind of important. It's kind of important if you don't have your paperwork, because that was the whole thing, especially when we're talking about the Haitians right now, because a number of the ones they were showing there were Haitian. Uh, they were one of the groups that were crossing last year, and there may st I think there still are Haitians who are crossing. But uh, there's been other groups that have been crossing ever since. And you never know, actually, because we've been seeing a rise in violence in Toronto that it's quite possible that this is where uh, this is where some of the violence is coming from. I mean, right now there's more people sitting in a Toronto homeless shelter than there are homeless Torontonians. So with that in mind, do we believe that some of these people may have turned to a life of crime? Quite possibly. I think it's very possible. I mean, there are these ethnic gangs that live in Toronto right now. So I could totally see it as being a possibility. I don't think it's the only possibility. I, I think it mostly has to do with gang violence. But the idea that these people come in, and then if they kind of learn about the local gang, they make their way into the local gang, I think it's quite possible. The violence has been uh, rising over the last couple years. It's not like it's just suddenly, it's just suddenly come, uh, like, hit a new high. Like, it's, it has hit a new high, but this has been steadily growing over the last few years. And the thing is, too, is like this article from CBC is, will the liberal common sense gun law changes do anything to address the spike in gun violence in Toronto? New gun control bill doesn't go far enough in tackling disturbing trend in gun crime, critics say. Well, the real problem with that doesn't so much have to do with the legislation itself. It has more to do with the fact that the legislation didn't address anything concerning guns and gangs it went after the type of guns and then went after made more regulations more restrictions for legal gun owners but it didn't actually do anything to address the idea that um it didn't do anything to address the idea of guns and gangs so you're going after people that already i don't know if the statistics are the same in america but i'm pretty sure they are because that in america gun owners actually have some of the lowest crimes committed per capita than um, than even cops. Like, cops are more likely to commit more crimes uh, per capita than a gun owner, which is saying a lot, especially considering there's a lot more gun owners in America than there are cops. Now, I assume there's something similar in Canada. I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure the stats are probably the same. So you're going after the people who are actually committing the lowest amount of crimes. It's already a bitch and a half in order to get a gun here in Canada. But you decide that you need to make it more difficult and restrict even more the type of weapons that people can get their hands on. Meanwhile, 
you've let the guns, you've let, uh, sorry, meanwhile, you've let the gangs get out of control. I mean, this has been a rising trend in Toronto for some time. But mean, but you haven't done anything, have you, Justin? You really haven't done anything to try and address the idea that, uh, that gangs are getting out of control. I mean, we have the Bloods and Crips and the MS-13 gang, and the MS-13 gang are the worst of the worst. They will commit the worst acts of violence, murder, rape, anything else in between. They will violently assault you and beat you down. These are the type of people that we have living in Toronto right now. They need to be addressed, and uh, something needs to be done about it. <coughs> But so far, we've seen very little. So far, we've seen uh, Mayor John Tory is a weak leader who has done nothing. Justin Trudeau is a weak leader who has done nothing. And no wonder that the gangs are getting out of control when that's the situation. Hold on. And that's why, hold on, where is it? Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. There we go. And that's why, if you can see here, uh, these are two tweets that were put out on July 3rd by... Uh, oh, wait, no, this is not the right tweets, actually. My mistake. Hold on, I got them here somewhere. I actually, they're not... Uh, I got them saved. But uh, this is why, again, I chose... I'm not 100% uh, so far with some of the things I've seen. I, there are some things that uh, Doug Ford has done that I'm not super, uh, super impressed about. All in all, since he's come in and everything he wants to do, he has impressed me more. Do I not have it? Oh, there they are. Hold on. I did save them. But one thing that he is planning on doing, just waiting for it to pull up, keep you all in suspense. There we go. Is uh, after on July second, he puts out the these tweets to say, "My heart goes out to the victims of the shooting in Toronto over the Canada Day weekend. This has been a very difficult summer for our city, and thoughts and prayers aren't going to cut it anymore. We need action, absolutely. This is the thing that's always killed me during shootings: is people say either thoughts and prayers just depends on which side you are. If you're on the religious side, it's prayers. If you're on the secular side, it's thoughts. It's the same pointless shit, in my opinion." It's doing the most bare minimum thing to actually solve the problem. You say, oh, thoughts and prayers. It's so I'm very glad that we actually now have a leader that's willing to do something about this and says, he says, we need action. Toronto is home to the greatest police officers. We need to make sure they have the resources to round up these criminals, build relationships in communities, and prevent these shootings. Looking forward to meeting with the representatives of the Toronto Police Service in the near future so we can work on a strategy to end this senseless violence. Finally, finally, someone that is doing something in order to fix the problems that we are seeing in Toronto right now and the gang violence. And one thing actually in his idea of rebuilding community, uh, like uh, the whole community um, relationship, one thing I think that actually be good is a return to beat cops, people that walk the streets, you know, that interact with the people. I think that would actually be a very good idea. And what you could do to, in order to... Um, to sort of have this uh, idea of beat cops is you could just hire on some more people and then have them more specifically working on that or at least for a time period but it'd give more jobs available in the police force where you hire people on you say okay we need people to walk the beats and if nobody's willing to walk the beats then you start assigning people and you say well sorry but you're going to have to do it for a while you're going to have to do it for a while that actually might be a good idea for cops starting out maybe a more easier assignment I don't know if that actually be technically more dangerous I don't think it would I, than being a cop, uh, like a first responder or something like that. But uh, but I think that would actually be a good way to rebuild relationships because people would see them around. People could interact with them a lot more. And especially if you assign the right people, the people with the proper attitudes to go and walk the beat and sort of interact with people who can sort of go up to a stranger and strike up a conversation with them, you know, and has a very pleasant demeanor. These are the type of people that could help rebuild relationships inside of these communities. But uh, to answer CBC's question, no, this whole, the first of all, the common sense gun laws was not common sense. <coughs> Yeah, the common sense gun laws was not common sense at all. It was uh, it was actually really dumbass 
uh, gun law changes. If they wanted to do anything that would be co uh, common sense uh, gun law changes, then it should be addressing guns and gangs and illegal firearms. As far as I know, most, if not all, of these shootings that took place over the Canada Day weekend and most of the shootings that have happened over since then and before then were not legal firearms. So this is, again, kind of showing we've had firearm legislation in Canada for a long time, and we're proving now how it doesn't actually work. While it's not been much of a problem beforehand, uh, it's the same thing in Ottawa. Ottawa is having a uh, been a large spike in uh, people who are committing gun violence in uh, gun, like gun violence here and Toronto and I'm sure a few other cities around the uh, around Canada are having the same problem right now so the gun legislation if the criminals aren't going to listen to the law then why the hell would it work they don't get their weapons from the gun store they get their weapons from black uh, black market dealers so it doesn't matter and the thing about getting them from these black market dealers too is they take ever, as many precautions as possible and make sure the gun can't be traced such as scratching off the serial number and they're usually burner guns you use them once uh, and then you throw them away so that way you like if you because if you commit a uh, because I know that the bullet, uh, when it's going through the rivets, when you fire it, it leaves a distinct pattern on the bullet, which can be traced back. That if you fi use it multiple times, they can actually trace back the rivets in the bullet to see it's fired from the same gun. So the Liberals' common sense gun laws really isn't going to do anything in order to... Uh, it really isn't going to do anything in order to fix the problem. Uh, on another note, uh, Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, his response is starting to change against the groping allegations that have been faced with. As ma many people are probably already aware, that back uh, there was a story that got released maybe within the last month or so. I think it was probably about the beginning of July. That was actually an art... Uh, an editorial piece from back uh, in a paper in year 2000 and this was at a event a co uh, that was it was uh, I'm trying to remember the exact place Kokney was that where it was anyway it was a uh, this is pretty much what's been going on is Justin Trudeau was uh, accused by a young woman from of uh, this paper of him like groping her uh, him of having a negative interaction with her and since then Justin Trudeau refused to address it for a long long time It was always his office that was addressing and they kept saying the same thing the Prime Minister doesn't remember any negative interaction which first of all Justin Trudeau said himself that if any any allegations came out against him, Then he would resign. Well, he ain't resigning. This is an allegation, but you ain't resigning uh, so he says that he also talks about how the woman has to be believed, but by the fact that he's pretty much saying, I don't remember any negative interaction, he was more or less calling the woman a liar because he's saying like, he's, he wasn't saying, well, she believes this. So it must be true. He's saying, oh no, I don't remember any negative interaction. So it probably didn't happen. I'm adding on the extra part. It probably didn't happen. But now his answer is starting to change his, um, but now his whole narrative on the subject is starting to change. He first addressed the situation back on Canada Day, but then this came out uh, yesterday. And this is what he's saying. Hold on. <coughs> I do not feel that I acted inappropriately uh, in any way, uh, but I respect uh, the fact that someone else might have experienced that differently. Justin Trudeau's tone. Ah, so now you say that you don't remember doing this. Before he was saying, like, he, <laughs> he doesn't believe it. Before he was pretty much saying he doesn't remember that situation. All he remembered is that he had a good day. But now he's saying, I don't remember having any bad recommendations. See, there's actually a difference in what he's saying here. Because the first one, he's saying, I don't remember the situation taking place. But the day was good and there was no negative interactions with anybody on the day. So... There you go. It probably didn't happen. Now he's saying he remembers the interaction, but he doesn't remember it being bad. Those are two very different circumstances. Let's listen to that again. <coughs> Oops. I do not feel that I acted inappropriately uh, in any way, uh, but I respect uh, the fact that someone else might have experienced that differently. Justin Trudeau's... Yeah, he said he doesn't feel that he interacted negatively. Again, 
so suddenly he remembers that situation now. But let's just let it go on a little bit more before we get too much into it. Tone today has noticeably changed from just a few days ago. I had a, a good day that day. I don't remember any uh, negative interactions that day at all. That, that was what they were saying about it. It was pretty much saying he doesn't remember any negative interactions. So he wasn't saying that he remembered that specific situation with that young reporter. He was saying that he doesn't remember any negative interactions. So that's a very different story than then saying that you don't feel that you acted in wrong, uh, wrongly in that situation. Ah. That kind of lawyerly language was criticized, with some saying they just didn't buy his answer. The allegation dates back to a BC festival in August of 2000, well before Trudeau entered politics. The next day, an unsigned editorial appeared in the local newspaper, the Creston Valley Advance. It accused Trudeau of groping and inappropriately handling an unnamed young female reporter. There were no other specifics about the alleged physical contact. The editorial says when Trudeau was asked about the incident, he responded, I'm sorry, if I had known you were reporting for a national paper, I never would have been so forward. If I uh, apologized later, then it would be because I sensed that she was not entirely comfortable with the interaction we had. The woman told CBC News that she doesn't want to comment on this story or have her name associated with it. But the newspaper's publisher from that time says she remembers speaking with the reporter after the incident and that she was upset by it. She also believes that the reporter wrote the editorial herself. Me too. Time's up. The Women's March. A groping allegation would be yeah, that's exactly the type of person that he is, supporting those things. And the thing is about those sort of things with Me Too and Time's Up is that they're kind of turning into witch hunts these days. And the thing is, is that she already put this out back in the early 2000s, this woman. Uh, but yet, it didn't really get much response at the time. Also, the other thing about the Women's March is the Women's March, I, it's hard to, res to have a lot of respect for it when they're all wearing pussy hats, you know, and they're all taking their kids out there. I don't think that's really the great message you want to send your kids with wearing pussy hats and, like, giant pussy costumes and shit. Uh, hold on, I also want to look up something real quick. Because, uh, I think it's actually pretty important. Uh, something I saw the other day, which pretty much stated that um, CBC was well aware of this story going on months ago. Hold on. The thing is, too, is actually what's worth bringing up is that... Um, that's worth bringing up is that he... Uh, is that none of this ever was taken in consideration with somebody like Patrick Brown when he went through what he went through. People were willing to throw him under the bus pretty much immediately. <coughs> <coughs> Without hearing both sides of the story. They were pretty much just willing to say, oh, no, 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 you know what? You, you've you been accused of this. You must be thrown out immediately. And even someone like Andrea Horwath has one of the first people to say that he should be, have to give up his seat as a sitting MPP. Not just give up his leadership, but his seat. Alrighty. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, I think I found it. I just gotta find the proper place. Uh, let me just quickly... Yeah, here it is. So, this apparently... I'll give credit where credit's due. I first ended up seeing this on a uh, article by Spencer Fernando, who I actually like a lot. I like Spencer Fernando. But it's a growing outrage after CBC reveals they had Trudeau's grope story for months before and didn't report on it. So, he links it to this article here, which is this one that came out on July 1st. But I, as I quickly looked down the highlight, it said, Earlier this year, CBC News spoke by phone and emailed uh, with the woman who was subject to the editorial. She said she was not interested in being associated with any, with any further coverage of the story. She also asked her name not be used and that she is not contacted about the story again. But the point is about this is the fact that... Um, was the fact that... Um, 
uh, they said earlier this year. Now, they don't actually specify, but I'm pretty sure when they say earlier this year, it was months ago, which means they've held on to this story for some time and didn't release it. It only got released because it was actually um, Warren Kinsella on Twitter. He said that somebody sent it to him. That somebody sent him the uh, old article and he read through it and then he saw what it was saying and then he released it on Twitter. And this started ended up putting out a lot of uh, – people started to take notice of it and then people started talking about it, which forced the media to report on it. However, this also means that CBC was well aware of this story and didn't report on it. Now – the, she said the woman who was involved with this story said she didn't want to, her name put on it and she didn't want to be contacted about it because at this point, you know, it's years later on. I'm sure she's probably got her own family now and things. So it's not really it's not really her fight anymore. Maybe that's how she's feeling. It's I'm just sort of assuming that's how, that's what her, her feelings are. Or it's just something she's gotten past in her life that she doesn't want to deal with. So she says she doesn't want her name put in and she doesn't want to be associated with the story that does not mean that uh that does not mean that they can't report on it so they held on to this story for a lot longer than necessary without reporting on it that's pretty damaging if you ask me the fact that our taxpayer funded news source is now refusing to report on something simply because it looked bad on our prime minister all right let's just finish up this video real quick uncomfortable for any politician but it is a particular challenge to Trudeau's reputation as an avowed feminist one who has said he takes a zero tolerance approach to sexual harassment I don't feel was in any way untoward today trying that's actually the other thing is what they say is the fact that we are only going by the same rules that Justin Trudeau set down. We're not actually coming at him with anything to do with legality. We're not asking for him to be uh, to be charged in court of law. We're you asking him to live by his own words. He has talked about how he has no time that, you know, with everything that goes on with sexual harassment, there needs to be changes made. Okay. He says that if he w that anybody in his cabinet who gets charged with it, they will be forced out of the cabinet. Okay, he said any allegations against him, he will uh, he will for uh, he will step down if there was any allegations against them. Okay, well here's the allegation, buddy. Live up to it. You also live up to being a male feminist, and he likes to talk about how back in college, him and his group of friends or whatever used to be against sexual assault and rape, like leading groups own awareness group or something like that. I can't really remember the full details right now. But the point is, is this is the way he's treated other guys. This is the way he slandered other guys. And now it comes, his chickens have come home to roost. He's hit with similar allegations of, of the way he's interacted with women, or at least a single woman. And suddenly, he's not living up to his end of the bargain. Suddenly, he's saying that he doesn't want to... Uh, Suddenly he's saying that, you know, well, I don't have to step down, even though I've stated in the past that I would. So that's I just want some consistency out of the dude. Really, that's more of what I'm asking for. I'm not really asking for anything more than that than just you were the one who stated this. So how about you actually uh, live up to your end of the bargain? And just give me one more second because there's something I want to... One more thing I want to cover. One more thing, real quick. Man, you. All right, that should be good. But one, uh, actually, one thing that somebody left me on, uh, one thing that somebody left me as a comment when concerning this whole thing, I don't really want to give the person away because I haven't asked them, so I'm just going to read the comment, not going to say where it was. But I end up talking about when uh, I was commenting on the whole uh, thing that was going on with Justin Trudeau in the past when it first came out. He said, uh, said, his statements regarding not knowing when she was uh, was working for a national paper should be admission enough. Around the same time as this story broke, and I can't seem to find it again, 
but a now retired police officer also came forward to say that they arrested Turdo for assault and the file was covered up. And he, uh, this person means, he or she means, on this day, the same day that, uh, or the same event that was going on, that Trudeau was arrested for assault and the file was covered up. I would bet dollars to donuts this idiot has more in this closet, and I would actually agree with that. So uh, I think that's a very important point to bring up, is that uh, is if, if there is something out there, if there are files out there that have talked about Trudeau being arrested in the past, I think it's very valid to everything that we're talking about. But let's just finish up this video real quick. There's probably another 40 seconds in it, and then we'll move on to another subject. Trying to quell questions, he if leaned in to that feminism. In, and I'll be blunt about it. Often a man experiences an interaction as being benign or not inappropriate, and a woman, uh, particularly in a professional context, can experience it differently, and we have to respect that and reflect on that. Trudeau was asked twice today if he'd launch an investigation into his own behavior, just like he has for other MPs and staff facing allegations. He dodged both questions. He did say, though, he did. he'd keep reflecting on how people can perceive an interaction differently. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Yeah, so other people have to have that same... Uh, other people get to have this. The, those... Uh, other people get to have a couple investigations into him, but him, oh no, we can't do that. Trudeau is the king of hypocrites. Thing is, is he's terrible for his public image too. The thing I wonder too is that I wasn't alive during the days of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. But I really wonder if this was the same sort of thing that people were dealing with back in the day with uh, his father, Trudeau Sr. Because if it is, you know what, no, I, it actually can't be because I get the feeling that Trudeau is not going to stay in for another term just for everything he's dealt with. <coughs> <coughs> for everything he's dealt with, I don't actually think he'll be able to stay in for a, a second term. I think he'll probably get voted out. I sure as hell hope so, but, uh, hmm, but, uh, yeah, no, if this is the sort of thing that they dealt with back in the, uh, the 70s and in the 80s with Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Jesus Christ, like father, like son, and you know what, the more I've done research into Pierre Elliott Trudeau, he was really not the good prime minister, not even close, a lot of people like to hold him up, but the only thing they really hold him up for is the Charter of Rights and Values, which, first of all, could be better written. That's what I'll say. There could be a lot better written than the fucking charter. I mean, I'm happy to have it because it's something, but it could be a hell of a lot better written. And, you know, he was the one who wrote it, and he was also, uh, but he was also one of the first people really to suspend uh, the, um, suspend Canadian rights. Because we already, we have two pretty much, uh, two uh, pieces of legislati le legislation that goes into the, uh, to become the charter which is the uh, British North American Act, which is uh, the first one that was done in eight, 1867. And that was also when we were uh, declared free, uh, when we were declared our uh, independent nation, when we were not, we were still part of the British Empire, but we were still, uh, we became our independent nation. That was the first one. And then it had to do everything with the Charter Act that ended up, uh, man, is that even the name of it? I'm fucking blanking right now. Sorry, I'm still feeling a little fuzzy from being sick. But anyway, the second piece of legislation was what was written by Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and that was incorporated with the British North American Act to become the Charter of Rights and Values, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Values. But we could have he could have done a much better job writing it in. But before that, before he even wrote the second piece of legislation, he was also the very first prime minister to suspend all Canadian rights and pretty much input martial law across Canada during the 1970 FLQ crisis. So, <coughs> Barry Elliott Trudeau is not the great Canadian Prime Minister that people want you to believe that he is. Alright, let's move on. So this next one is an article that comes out of the post-millennium. Millennial. Post-millennial. Trudeau government now controls Facebook content mods. This is scary to say the least. No kidding! 
Now, this has to do with preparing to go into the uh, preparing to go into the 2019 election. What can, what Trudeau wants to do is that you know I've said before that Trudeau is an idiot, but at the same time, maybe he's not as dumb as we all give him credit for, uh, as we get to talk about it. He is like, <coughs> <coughs> and what I mean by this is there's certain things that he focuses on, which actually are kind of good ideas. And this, uh, what I mean by this is because he's he's put up much a lot of focus more on Twitter. He's put a lot of focus on Facebook, and why this is actually from his standpoint a good idea. And maybe this is numbers starting to change right now, but up until before the whole uh, everything went down with Cambridge Analytica on Facebook, Facebook was still where 80% of the people who received their news and content online received it. Facebook was still the most popular news, uh, popular website that people use. It was more popular than Twitter, Instagram, and all the other ones that are out there right now. So when he started putting restrictions on Facebook and started targeting Facebook, from his standpoint, it was actually a good idea because he was getting, he was cornering the largest market on online content. Because that that even includes uh, websites like uh, YouTube. A lot more people get their content on Facebook than they do on YouTube. Usually, I believe that is in sharing, uh, sharing news articles rather than videos, but even videos. So as it go, this article goes on to say, Facebook Canada has recently hired independent fact checkers to be in charge of vetting new content and blog posting on its platform. They explain uh, Their explained defense is the fear of false and misleading information on social media. However, the problem with this news is the term independent. Facebook's can, uh, Facebook Canada's head of po uh, public policy is Kevin Chan. Kevin Chan is ex-policy director for former liberal leader Michael Ignatieff. <coughs> The same Kevin Chan that was recently questioned by NDP MP as to why he had not yet registered as a lobbyist, even though he had private meetings with senior cabinet members, including Finance Minister Bill Morneau. Translation, it looks like Trudeau government has a relationship that is simply too close for comfort with Facebook. Issue becomes even more disturbing when we remember the fairly recently Gerald Butts, Trudeau's top advisor, labeled anybody who criticized the Prime Minister for his people kind gaffe as alt-right Nazis in, tweet, in a tweet. Mr. Mr. Butts has proven over and over that he has no tolerance for anyone who criticizes or even parodies Trudeau's government. In his view, the rest of the country should simply learn that opposing liberals is not just wrong, but also evil. Interesting note, recently a Catherine McKinna parody Twitter account was shut down at Gerald Butts' request. Yes, it was. Yes, it really was. <coughs> I'm sorry about all the coughing, everyone, though. Maybe a cigarette is not the best idea right now. I mean, that's probably a pretty dumb decision on my part. But uh, this is something that Trudeau has been focusing on since back in February. And I actually want to correct the record that I've – something I've said publicly a few times, and it turns out I was wrong, is that I said he only started focusing on the whole Facebook situation when uh, – he only started focusing on Facebook after his trip to India, and that's not actually true. As I kind of look back through the timeline, I realized that he had started focusing on Facebook before he went to India. But I do think that it was also it's. I think the reason behind it was still the same is that he was aware that a lot of the uh, people got a lot of their content online, and that he couldn't really control the narrative online as he could when we're talking about uh, in the press. I mean. He already, uh, they fund the CBC, the government funds the CBC, so I wouldn't be surprised, like, maybe not at the editor level, but, like, it's, when we're getting into more of the top brass, things get suppressed by them when in, at the request of the government. And then recently in the, I believe it was the 2018 budget, the government was talking about how it was going to, uh, about how it was going to subsidize local papers, which I actually think is much more dangerous than anything else. Because, uh, like, a lot of these papers are owned by bigger companies. But all in all, I think they're, these papers are usually given free reign on their own to uh, sort of go out and do their own thing. Hold on. Ow. I still do have it saved. Yes. Hold on. I got two things I want to show you. But I think all in all that uh, the Trudeau government kind of allowed, uh, sorry, all in all that the local papers are allowed a little more free reign. 
And here we go. Most Canadians support government funding of local uh, local media poll finds. Yeah, I question that. And you see what I've highlighted. Local news and innovative technologies. Harry Center uh, Melanie Jolie says this is what they're talking about. They were funding for 55% of Canadians support uh, or somewhat support additional government funding to keep local news sources open. We will not bail out models that are no longer viable. Now, I actually think this is the most telling part of it because that is a perfect way to stop funding a certain news source that is not pull, towing the line. As you say, they are no longer viable. We're not going to uh, bail them out. We're not going to subsidize them anymore. So I think that's a very good way of keeping people in charge, of uh, keeping people in control. And uh, the next thing I wanted to show, actually, is we all know what the situation is when it comes to... Uh, we all know what the situation is in the UK right now. I mean, the UK is awful. I mean, we already have, um, it's already going down the route of 1984 and going there, there pretty quickly. Um, but we also know about these whole media blackouts that are there, that they can do, pull at any moment. And this is actually something that came out on February 6, 2008, which I think is very concerning too, is the fact that, um, is this one from the Irish Times. Was talking to Theresa May amounts, quote, good quality journalism provides with information analysis. We need to inform our viewpoints and conduct a genuine discussion. It is a huge force for good, but in recent years, especially in local journalism, we've been falling we've seen falling circulation, a hollowed out of local newsrooms, and fears of the future sustainability on high quality journalism, she said. Culture Secretary Matt Hancock said the area review was needed because of the importance of free press and culture of democracy. So Theresa May is also focusing on uh, on local journalism, which is pretty disturbing to me because I think she's trying to go as quickly as possible towards a dictatorship. This is their conservative leader, their conservative prime minister, but she's been terrible. Oh my God, Theresa May is awful, an awful leader. absolutely ridiculous but the fact that she's also putting the focus on local journalism kind of concerns me because that's what trudeau and his government wants to do but now they're trying to put the focus on online content and let's not forget that not too long ago facebook announced that they they were going to be well i guess i guess is sort of what this was covering too this whole post millennium article millennial post millennial article it had to do with the idea that uh, it was going to be have fact checkers and this was more focusing on the 2019 election so our government is doing everything it can to gain control over the narrative are you scared yet all right now the final thing i wanted to bring up this was an article out of the toronto sun on july 3rd that was written by Tarek fatah Hold on, let me just switch this over from there. There we go. Fatah, Islamic Relief and other is Islamist groups to receive $23 million. And who announced it? Of course, Ikra Khalid. Oh, great. The architect of M103. Oh, I'm sure this is going to be nice, fair, and balanced. It's not like Ikra Khalid is a terrible fucking politician who should be ousted as fast as fucking possible. <coughs> <clears throat> on the afternoon of June 27th, while most of Canada was at work or watching the World Cup matches, sorry, hair on my tongue, <clears throat> a major funding announcement was made with little fanfare in front of no more than a couple dozen mostly Muslim audience in Pakistani can ca of Pakistani Canadians. Hmm, how interesting. Mississauga Arendale MP Ikra Khalid, who has been the mouthpiece of the Vision Motion M103 on Islamophobia, stood in her constituency office to announce that the Trudeau government was investing an additional $23 million into its multiculturalist program. With no mainstream media in attendance to ask any questions, how very convenient. Not that I'm necessarily thinking they would ask the right questions, but the idea that there was none, no real mainstream media in the or press in the the audience is very telling to what they're trying to do trying to keep it on the down low as much as possible khalid boasted that her hard work has resulted into tangible action yeah bringing us closer to a goddamn dictatorship 
She listed the following two groups as being among the recipients of the new uh, the new funding. The National Council of Canadian Muslims, a former uh, a former branch of the U.S. based Council for American Islamist Relations, who have been connected to terrorist organizations in the past. Oh, here we go. That was named in 2008 as an unindicted co-conspirator connected to the larger terror funding trial in U.S. history. NCCM has denied links to CARE. You can deny it all you want, but I don't think it's really making much of a difference. I really do think that they... I'm trying to dig up the evidence now, but I'm pretty sure that the NCCM does have connections to these groups in the past. Islamic Relief, a worldwide charity accused of links to Islamist extremists by Middle East Forum... Israel and United uh, Arab Emirates, among others. There is no solid record that the, Cana uh, that the Canadian arms of these two organizations have contributed to the current problematic behavior. Nonetheless, for over a year, many uh, Muslim Canadians, including yours truly, Tarek Fatah, my son colleague Farzana Hassan, as well as other Muslim critics of Islamism, has warned that the M103 initiative was much more than the victimhood culture of guilt being forced into ordinary Canadians. Absolutely, that was what it was all about. See, the whole thing, too, when we talk about uh, Islamophobia, is that it's actually, there's not many hate crimes that take place in Canada. I think over the entire year, last year, there was like 150 hate crimes that were committed against the Muslim community, which, first of all, not the biggest group. That was not the biggest group to receive uh, hate against them. It's So far as I check it out, it's usually the Jewish community, and then it's the LGBT community, and then it's the Muslim community, but they focus on the Muslim community all the time for the hate crimes that are put against them. And most of these hate crimes are actually very, very minor. They're very minor as in people who are... Uh, uh, very minor as in people who are... Um, uh, you like writing stuff on on walls or saying certain things it's really not that big it's like in comparison uh to what they could be this the biggest like one in 2018 turned out to not even be real and that's the hijab hoax i mean jesus christ they can't even uh keep this up like they can't even keep up with their like as make it real they can't even actually give us real tangible evidence that hate crimes, Islamophobia, is a real thing in Canada. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, I want to show you guys something, but uh, always take it with a grain of salt because this seems to be a very partisan uh, uh, website. But uh, I, they do bring up some good points, and they do provide evidence to back it up. All right. So I'm just going to quickly go over it. So this is from a website called Canadian Pride Canada Wide. And it's talking about the Moss hoax lies continue. Now this has to make reference to, if you remember somewhere in earlier June, there was that uh, idea, uh, there was that uh, moss that was set on fire. And people were talking about, like, all our politicians came out against how it's unacceptable. But this one is, uh, has been showing how it's uh, talking about how it was a hoax. Now, I'd have to look a little more into it to be sure, but I figured just that we bet we might as well bring it up. So it was Edson Mosk that he's, they're talking about. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, and so what they're kind of talking about is this idea that that the whole thing was actually staged and was not really going to be nearly as bad as they thought. So first, the one, the main thing that they kept bringing up had to do with the fact that. Uh, so first of all, they're talking about how there was no cameras yet. This has actually been updated from the last time I checked it out too. So they talked about how there were no cameras yet. There seemed to be three pretty distinct cameras that could see where the the mosque was, and see the area that if there was actually the fire, or at least a few more. Damn. The other thing that they were bringing up, and I'm having trouble just seeing it right now. Is has to do that uh, there was the amount of worshippers because they were kept going from there was only one or two worshippers there, and then they started going on to how it was over a dozen. These are different mu news sources, and there were dozens of them. So which one is it? Is there were there only one or two, or were there actually dozen about uh, dozen dozens of worshippers there? Which is a big difference if you ask me. 
The other thing that has to be taken in consideration has to be the fact that many hate crimes are actually done by people in the community, and it's done in order to sort of whatever, bring attention to themselves or try and make themselves look like an oppressed minority. Like a good example would be how many uh, synagogues are actually com uh, with, that have like swastikas and stuff put on them are actually against uh, – how many swastikas are actually uh, uh, committed by other Jewish members. But uh, the other thing is too – where was it? Where was it? Man, they've updated this shit. Should have checked this out, but I didn't even think about it until I started. Oh, wait. Maybe I'm on... Ah, I think I was on a wrong one. Maybe I was on one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, here we go. So, he, this is from... Uh, CBC News. It says... Right down here, three people who were praying inside the had left the Edson Mosque about 200 kilometers west of Edmonton and were still in the parking lot when the fire started the building south entrance at around 11 p.m. local time. <coughs> <coughs> now, I'm not sure which article this is. They don't really make reference to which news source, but then as we can see, they say that the fire started as dozens of people were leaving the evening prayer. Muslims around the world were celebrating Eid al-Fitr, the end of Ramadan. I probably missed now. Oh, it was CTV, as they stated down here. It was CTV News. So, that's a pretty big difference. Now, I understand that these are different news sources, but three to a dozen or more? Like, come on. And they also said it was done at the back door. Now they're saying that the fire damaged the front door. And, like, so, like, which one is it? The other thing is, too, is I got to agree with them. All right, so I think this one, one second, let me just... All right, but the other thing is, too, is this is the whole... Here it is, the picture of the damage done to the, the mosque. That's a pretty small fire for somebody who is actually trying to commit a fire. Also, you're not really doing a good job because you're, do, you're doing it in a concrete building. And... Uh, Oh, that's a better picture. You're trying to set fire to a concrete building, which isn't exactly going to go over so well. Uh, also, the thing is, is these sort of houses, like, well, it's a mosque, but these sort of buildings, they always have built-in fire protection, too. Like, there is actually siding that is put on that is fire resistant, so you're really not going to get a good start, even with gasoline on this thing. But anyway, my whole point is, is just that even it, there is a lot of suspicion around these, this mosque here around the fire that was done on the mosque and there's really not enough ev a lot of evidence to support the idea of uh islamophobia in our country yet this is something that is constantly pushed by the liberals constantly pushed by ikra khalid and now they're saying that they're giving relief uh to these uh to these muslim groups which may have even been connected to a lot of terrorism or at least extremist activities and it was all done in secret or as secret as they could possibly do it they did it in front of a group of uh, Canadian Pakistanis. They did it all without the press being around. It's just very suspicious to me. And one thing that needs to be bring, brought, brought up in the past is many times these mosques are used as a form of... Uh, excuse me. These mosques are used as a uh, cover because there's been so many times where... Well, if, if we're talking about the Middle East where their war has been going down, a lot of... Uh, a lot of combatants will actually t seek refuge in a mosque and they will fight from the mosque, which forces whoever the force may be, whether that's Canadian troops, American troops, or whoever, it forces them to fight them in the mosque and then they can sort of point to them and talk about how our troops are attacking mosques. They also use them uh, to transport whatever, drugs, weapons. I mean, there was a... Uh, uh, see if I can quickly pull it up. But there was a German mosque that got raided that had dozens of ak-47s that were being stored in there and this is a common trait in a lot of these uh a lot of these mosques and a lot of these groups that this is what they do so it's worth bringing up and it's worth pointing out because this is the big you don't really see this in uh christianity you know you don't really hear about churches being used to harbor drugs and uh to harbor drugs and harbor guns 
Pedophiles, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Pedophiles. But you know what? The, the uh, mosques are, are just as bad. Hold on. Let's see. Let's see if I can pull it up. Let's see. Yes, I think I found it. Let's see if they could have a picture with it. Because that was really telling more than anything. You can just say they had dozens of AK-47s. Yeah, here we go. Not the picture I remember, but that's okay. This was... Well, I guess this was actually a while ago. It was uh, back in 2016, it says. So a couple years ago. But this... Uh, I swear, I thought it was more recent than that. Maybe it was another one that they saw. But this is all... Like, this is sort of the thing I'm making reference to. So then when we have a group that's connected with... Uh, when we have a group that's connected to extremism, that's connected to terrorist groups or even loosely, and we're going to throw them, what was it, $23 million? Is that really such a good idea? Probably not, in my point of view. Probably not. And it's not the first time that we have this sort of situation going down. Here's another one, actually. This one's from uh, October 25th, 2017, later on. They seize lots of guns, lots of ammo. It's from routers. So just when you talk about, like, you then want to give $23 million to these groups connected with these sort of people, it makes me really nervous. And when you do the whole thing behind uh, closed doors, that makes me even more suspicious of what your activity is, what you're really doing. But I think that's all I got for you on the podcast today. Thank you all for tuning in. My name's Adrian Lloyd. This is just my stupid opinion.